Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Thomas Kidd in the History Department and also a Senior Fellow in the Institute for Studies of Religion, which is uh, co-hosting this event today with uh, the Texas Collection. Uh, glad to welcome you to this event. If you don't know about the Institute for Studies of Religion, uh, we're an interdisciplinary institute on campus that uh, sponsors the study of religion in all kinds of disciplines, uh, from uh, health to philosophy, uh, social sciences, and uh, also historical studies of religion, uh, a program which I direct with uh, Professor Philip Jenkins, who is here today. Uh, and so we're happy to, to welcome you to this uh, event. I think many of you know that uh, as a nation, we're continuing to observe the uh, sesquicentennial of the Civil War, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, uh, is a kind of ongoing commemoration uh, for the United States right now. We're approaching the midpoint uh, of the 150th anniversary of the war, and this uh, summer is the uh, anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, which I think a lot of people see as the high point of, uh, of the war. Uh, and we have been uh, holding various events on campus related to the 150th anniversary. Uh, the Institute for Studies of Religion hosted Professor George Rabel uh, a year or two ago uh, from the University of Alabama to talk about his book on religion and the Civil War. And uh, we're happy to host today uh, Professor Paul Harvey to speak about uh, the battle for Jesus during the Civil War. Uh, professor Harvey is professor of history and presidential teaching scholar at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. He's a graduate of Oklahoma Baptist University uh, and also the University of California, Berkeley, where he got his PhD. Professor Harvey is the author and editor of eight books in American religious history, including uh, recently, The Color of Christ, The Son of God and the Saga of Race in American History, which was co-authored by Ed Bloom, University of North Carolina Press. Uh, also, Moses, Jesus, and the Trickster in the Evangelical South, University of Georgia Press. And Freedom's Coming, Religious Cultures in the Shaping of the South from the Civil War through the Civil Rights Era, University of North Carolina Press. And I think you can see from just those book titles that he is a renowned expert on the topic of race, ethnicity, and religion in the history of the American South. So help me to welcome uh, Professor Paul Harvey. Thank you all so much for coming. Can you all hear me fine? Microphone's good up there, okay. Uh, a special welcome to you undergraduates who are here collecting your extra credit points. I really appreciate you all being here for that. Um, today I'm gonna talk about some material from this recent book that Tommy mentioned um, the, son, uh, the Color of Christ, the Son of God, and the Saga of Race in America, which is a book about how people have perceived and imposed various racial preconceptions on Jesus in American history. But I want to focus today particularly on the Civil War era, by which I mean more or less the 1830s through the 1890s, what I call, when I do my teaching, the Civil War era. This morning I heard some wonderful papers focusing particularly on the Civil War in, uh, in and around Baylor University in Independence, Texas. So that was kind of the ground eye, really detailed view. So for you guys, this is more like the 30,000 foot level flyover view, and we can drill down and get into some of the de details of it later. Um, when I originally talked to Tommy about this, I told him that what I really wanted to do was give a talk on Oklahoma Sooner football, and he suggested maybe that wasn't such a good idea, so we'll skip <laughs> over that. Okay, little joke there. The, the battle for Jesus during the Civil War era was really a struggle about who and what would count as sacred in American society. And what I'm going to talk about today is transitions in how Jesus came and appeared to people in the Civil War era. Uh, from the antebellum era, the image on my left, I guess your, your left as well, um, is from 1834, William Pendleton's uh, image of Jesus from 1834, an era in which the image of Jesus as a white man was in effect being created in American history, not only being created, but also being mass distributed. 
The image on the right there, you all know that guy, Werner Salman's Head of Christ from 1941. The image in the middle is from a black folk artist named Clementine Hunter. Uh, and we don't know the year, actually, that this was painted. It's called Cotton Crucifixion. And I think by putting these three images together, it gives you kind of a quick summary overview of some of the major themes that we're gonna talk about here. And that is to say, the way in which Jesus was racialized as white in the 19th century, the way that was both challenged and reified by uh, people during the Civil War era, and the way in which a white Jesus emerged triumphant at the end of the day. For white Southerners, Christ's truth marched on with Confederate soldiers. Their sacrifices were understood as expiation for regional <coughs> sins. A lily white Jesus pervaded the lost cause in the film version, of course, of Thomas Dixon's The Klansman, devastatingly employed an ethereal Jesus to preside over the triumph of the Klan. Meanwhile, the black Southern Christ, an apolitical suffering servant, may have appeared as white in imagery and symbolism, but became a black Southerner in the act of suffering, an oppressed slave, a victim of a crucifixion lynching, a poor migrant. Long before the rise of black theology in the civil rights era, slaves and freed African Americans imagined, painted, sermonized about, and musically portrayed a black Jesus who was a figure of liberation. For them, Jesus's white imagery belied his black sympathies. The Southern Jesus sanctified suffering and assured triumph. He appeared in white and black guises. He transformed the region and individual souls. He led armies and rode milk white horses. He materialized in the form of civil war generals and civil rights leaders. In short, he entered the era, uh, he entered both the white and black imaginary as a figure of immediate, tangible, enormous power. Jesus as Southerner was a transformative figure, and as the South developed into the Bible Belt, the figure of Jesus was associated with the region in the popular mind. From amazing grace to saving grace, from Christ in the camp to the color purple, and from spirituals to country blues and soul, a racially divided but viscerally present Southern Jesus became the American Jesus. Studying the battle for Jesus during the Civil War explains much about how and why this happened. And what we see here in the final slide is a book I'll talk about later, Christ in the Camp. And then finally, sort of the end point of the talk is the emergence of Jesus presiding over the triumph of the Ku Klux Klan in famously in the movie Birth of a Nation from 1915. Southern whites before the Civil War tried to sanctify slavery and Christianize slaves by presenting Jesus as a servant. But African Americans took this savior and found in him a personal friend to those who suffered like they did. Many transformed the white and servant Jesus into a trickster of the Trinity, that is to say a white man who destabilized white supremacy. Some Northern whites and abolition, abolitionists and idealists felt similarly. They joined these slaves in viewing Christ as either a Southern slave in spirit or a white man who aligned with black Americans. Pro-slavery forces may have won the battle for the Bible, as Eugene Genovese has argued effectively, but they lost the joust for Jesus. By the time of the Civil War, Christ had become symbolically affiliated with Southern slaves, leaving slaveholders up with their blood up for a fight. Union soldiers in the Civil War marched to a new hymn that taught that since a faraway savior had died to make men holy, they should now die to make men free. Confederates, though, considered Christ to be on their side. But when they lost national independence in their slaves, they thought themselves buried with Jesus. They arose from the ashes of physical and spiritual chaos with a new savior, one who shared their sufferings during Reconstruction. Now they, not enslaved blacks, were crucified under an imperial regime, just as Jesus had been. The most belligerent of them clothed the Son of God in white, he became not just a member of the Ku Klux Klan, but its original founder. And in a final irony, even some former abolitionists joined in the post-war sacralization of the white American nation, as in this image here from Alma White's book, which is a history of Pentecostalism in part, uh, and also a glorification of the Klan from 1915. And what you see here is Jesus um, distributing the bread and loaves uh, to Klansmen who will then distribute it to the multitude, a grotesque image from the Bible story. Before the war, many Southern whites 
um, joined new pro-slavery ideas that bondage was a positive good to older ideas that slavery was a necessary evil. They found many passages to support slavery in the Bible. When it came to Jesus, though, they were flummoxed. Although most pro-slavery spokesmen were biblical literalists who denounced abolitionists for their historically contingent readings of the Bible, the voices for bondage abandoned common sense realism when approaching Jesus. When it came to Jesus, pro-slavery voices first turned to an argument for absence. That is to say, Jesus didn't say anything, so he must not have been against it. Jesus never denounced human bondage, they said, and others said that uh, they, uh, others accused anti-slavery voices of, repra of replacing Christ with politics. But these voices were perennially on the defensive in the 19th century. Christ's interactions with the sufferings troubled them. His parables, and most especially the golden rule, vexed them. It needed a special dose of pro-slavery revising. One of the most influential Southern ministers, James Henley Thornwell, preached that to take the golden rule literally would lead to, quote, the grossest wickedness. Jesus did not mean that a Christian should treat one another as he or she wanted to be treated. Instead, quote, our Savior directs us to do unto others what, in their situations, it would be right and reasonable in us to expect from them. Rendered this way, the golden rule should take into account status, power, and position. Although Jesus was hard to make into an, exactly an advocate for bondage, he was easy to bring into the pro-slavery, uh, anti-slavery camp. So abolition, abolitionists made Jesus their own. They pushed Christ so close to the oppressed that some even began locating the spirit of Christ in and among slaves, a remarkable development uh, of the 19th century. Culturally and ideologically, black men became surrogate figures for Jesus. Freedom's Journal, was the first African American, uh, first American newspaper owned and operated by African Americans running from 1827 to 29. It regularly heralded the golden rule as an anti-slavery edict. One letter to the editors shrugged off the seemingly pro-slavery culture of the Old Testament and defended the anti-slavery cause with the single law which fell from the lips of him, as ye would that men should do unto you, even so do ye unto them. To this writer, the golden rule leveled the system, excuse me, leveled the odious system of slavery forever. Before he was an American hero, Jesus was a crusader for abolition. Captured in Boston in 1854, only to become a cause celeb among locals who opposed the, the harsh Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Virginia runaway Anthony Burns reported to the New York Tribune that as a young man he had learned that there is a Christ who makes us free. That inspiration led to his flight. Frederick Douglass famously went to great pains to distinguish between his deep love for Christ and his hatred for pro-slavery Christianity. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ, he said. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. In this context, at least one Northern black imagined a Messiah beyond whiteness. Robert Alexander Young prophesied that a Messiah of ambiguous racial, racial classification was about to bring universal freedom. In the Ethiopian Manifesto of 1829, Young attacked slaveholders as monsters incarnate and quoted the biblical God as saying, surely hath the cries of the black, a most persecuted people, ascended to my throne and craved my mercy. Now, behold, I will stretch forth my hand and gather them to the palm, that they become unto me a people and I unto them their God. The Lord had sent a new savior. He would have, quote, long and flowing hair and would appear to be a white man, but he was actually born of a black woman. The new Messiah, therefore, would call together the black people as a nation unto themselves. This is in 1829 that we're talking about. <clears throat> Within the confines of Southern slavery, it was difficult to confront directly the slaveholders' conception of Christ, but some did so. One was Nat Turner. One early August morning in 1831, Turner led a band of fewer than 100 slave rebels against the uh, whites of Southampton County, Virginia. By the time his group had been defeated, it had killed more than 60 of them. In the aftermath, hundreds of black men were executed, their heads put on poles lining the road to the town of Jerusalem. While imprisoned, 
Nat Turner was interviewed by Thomas Gray, a white attorney. Turner, in Gray's rendition, claimed to be led by God, and he forthrightly, forthrightly likened himself to Jesus. Turner had a vision of spirits fighting, and the good ones were the lights of the Savior's hand stretched forth from east to west. Turner saw drops of blood on some corn, and he inter interpreted these natural signs as Christ's call for rebellion. Quote, for as the blood of Christ has been shed on this earth and has ascended to heaven for the salvation of sinners, it was now returning to earth again in the form of dew. For Turner, it was clear, the great day of judgment was at hand. After listening to Turner's tales of his enchanted world, Gray asked Turner, do you find yourself mistaken now? Turner answered simply, was not Christ crucified? In the eyes of blacks then and later, Nat Turner died as Jesus had, executed by a state that oppressed his people. Turner's execution sentence, however, declared that he would, quote, be hung by the neck until you are dead, 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 and may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Like Nat Turner, John Brown, too, thought that Jesus had called him to a holy war. Brown's raid of Harper Ferry in 1859 shocked the nation. After the failure of his misbegotten plan and his capture, Brown penned letters to friends, family, friends, and supporters to assure them that he was a true follower of the crusading Christ. Brown felt personally tied to slaves through the teaching of Jesus, especially the golden rule. Christ told me, he wrote a northern minister, to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, to do towards them as I would wish them to do towards me in similar circumstances, his own invocation of the golden rule. He also explained that his violence followed biblical guidelines. You know that Christ once armed Peter, so also in my case, I think he put a sword into my hand and there continued it so long as he saw best and then kindly took it from me. And finally, Brown comforted his family by comparing himself to Jesus, just as Turner did. Remember, dear wife and children all, that Jesus of Nazareth suffered a most excruciating death on the cross as a felon under the most aggravating circumstances. Many Northerners were riveted by Brown, the so-called meteor of the war. Not a traitor, lunatic, or heretic, Brown was heralded as a Christ-like mortar. Reverend Edwin Wheelock claimed, the gallows from which he ascends to heaven will be in our politics what the cross is in our religion. To be hanged in Virginia is like being crucified in Jerusalem. It is the last tribute that sin pays to virtue. Just a few years later, Union soldiers sang that John Brown was John the Baptist of Christ we are to see, Christ who of the bondman shall the liberator be. So something new was happening to Jesus. The Son of God was becoming aligned with the slaves of the South, despite the best efforts of brilliant pro-slavery theologians in the South. Just as slaves were claiming direct and personal relationships with Jesus, abolitionists were conflating the Southern slave with Christ. So the slave became an analog for Christ, most spectacularly so in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, published in 1852. The illustration there is from the first illustrated edition in 1853. The figure on the far left you see there is Jesus presiding um, and admonishing and judging the beating to death of Uncle Tom in the novel. The beating, uh, and, the beating and death of the innocent and pious but spiritually powerful Uncle Tom mimicked the crucifixion. Tom was a redemptive figure. Before his own death, he saw a vision of the dying Christ. Stowe felt moved by stories of African Americans witnessing the divine. And to her, it showed that African Americans possessed a racial spiritual sense that whites did not. <clears throat> to Stowe, if white Americans desired to learn true Christianity, they needed men and women of color. The Anglo-Saxon race, which she viewed as cool, logical, and practical, had trouble comprehending Christianity because, quote, God gave the Bible to them in the fervent language, language and with the glowing imagery of the more susceptible and passionate Oriental races. The character of Uncle Tom, to say the least, has not fared well in the American imagination. He has been seen as too passive and too pious. His faith let him be brutalized 
and Stowe's form of romantic racialism only gestures at appreciating African Americans. And to make the matters worse, Uncle Tom was turned, of course, into a um, character on stage plays in the 19th century, such that by the 1880s and 1890s, Uncle Tom was most often encountered as a happy singing darky on the theater stage in the North. Criticisms of Stowe and Uncle Tom may be accurate, but for many black Americans of his age, identification with Christ was a means to transcend the nation and its legal codes. 19th century black theologian Edward Blyden portrayed Jesus not only as a mediator and suffering uh, and savior for suffering African American people, but also as a blessed illustration of the glorious fact that persecution and suffering and contempt are not proof that God is not the loving father of a people, but may be rather as evidence of nearness to God, seeing that they have been chosen to tread in the footsteps of the firstborn of, his, of the creation. Being like Christ, according to Blyden, made African Americans a special and holy people. By the time the Civil War came then, a host of white Americans directly connected Jesus to the slave. The Christ of American civilization is the slave, said a writer for William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. His heart is with the bleeding heart of humanity, whether under the slaveholder's lash or the tyrant's law. Southern whites had tried to claim Christ, but had failed. And now abolitionists were equating the Son of God with the slaves of the South. One Southerner exclaimed, we have understood that one popular clergyman at the North, an abolitionist, has gone so far as to say that Jesus Christ was a Negro. To what folly and extravagance will not wickedness subject its slaves? It did not matter, though, what the Apostle Paul counsel or what the Mosaic law allowed, for Jesus was on the side of the slaves. Christ was taught to the slaves as a servant who serves. Slaves made him a servant who suffers, like them. Abolitionists took Christ's teachings and ethics, applied them to the American context, and concluded that if God, the Son of God were here, then he would be a slave, or at least spend most of his time with slaves. Pro-slavery apologists battled back, but when it came to Jesus, they made arguments about absence or historical context. They balderized passages like the Golden Rule and abandoned their literalist and common sense readings of the Bible to defend the peculiar institution. Now, Uncle Tom's cabin was not the only Christ figure. Uncle Tom was not the only Christ figure in Uncle Tom's cabin. Jesus was there too in the artwork, as we saw earlier. And by the age of Abraham Lincoln, the United States was fast becoming a land awash in images of Christ's body and in particularly uh, whitened images of Christ's body. Jesus then became a fractured symbol in a divided land, a white deity who could be deployed for and against various forms of white supremacy. When the war ended, his ethics and body remained points of contest. Former slaves hailed the new era as the age of King Jesus who had come to liberate. Former masters tried to take Jesus back from the slaves and associate him with their own crucifixion during Reconstruction. Meanwhile, some Northern radicals dreamed that somehow Jesus could make the nation a land of both racial justice and sectional harmony. What ultimately occurred through all this was a great reversal and resurrection. By the end of the century, the American Christ who had come to identify with slaves was transformed into a messiah of former slaveholders, a neo-Confederate Christ who subjugated black people in the name of liberty and democracy. Jesus as an overt physical symbol of white supremacy was born only after dreams of Confederate independence died and reconstruction had severed the legal ties between whiteness and citizenship. During the war, Confederates seized the opportunity to reclaim Jesus. Confederates looked to Christ as a warrior who experienced mortal pain. They grabbed the Jesus of the slave imagination, grafted it onto their national agenda, and created a new hybrid. Jesus would be in the South, not as a slave, but as a warrior for the cross. Determined to have God on their side, the new Confederate government put the Lord front and center of its new national constitution very much unlike the American Constitution, which does not mention God or Jesus. 
invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God, the Confederacy's Constitution implicitly critiqued the moral failing of the United States Constitution. Meanwhile, Confederates militarized Jesus in their imagery, becoming good soldiers of Jesus Christ meant learning how to kill and how to die. One Confederate soldier from Tennessee believed that he who kills the greatest number of abolitionist thieves and their abettors is the best Christian. For others, it was learning how to die or to cope with death that mattered just as much. Jesus was a rugged leader of troops, but also a tender warrior who could comfort the afflicted. Mildred Lynch wrote in her diary of attending a church service at the war's beginning, at which the preacher made the congregates feel the rest through Jesus that remains for the people of God, and we were comforted. Oh, may the brave soldiers return to us, not only victorious, but may each one enlist under the banner of the cross. Following the Prince of Peace was while making war, though, was sometimes easier said than done. Eliza Frances Andrews in Georgia confided that she refused to believe that when Christ said, love your enemies, he meant Yankees. As the war dragged on and as the Union Army gradually beat down the Confederate forces, white Southerners faced their greatest fear. The Confederate nation was killed and with it the institution of slavery. Here was the dilemma and the Confederates seemed to know it. Jesus of the Bible was a suffering servant. The sufferers of the South, however, were black and enslaved, not white and free. Add to this the fact that the militant Jesus had by 19, 1865 failed to lead them to victory. All this left people in the South deeply troubled. How could Christ be on their side if they lost the flight, fight and if they were not the worst afflicted? The Union was not going to be beaten either on the battlefield or in claims to Christ. Northerners too enlisted Jesus in their armies. Northerners disagreed on how and when or even whether slavery should be abolished and whether black people should have any rights, but most seemed to agree with a private from Maine who wrote that, quote, the theology that sanctions slavery savors too strongly of Satan to be tolerated. The religion of, the, of Jesus Christ has nothing in common with the auction block or the lash. In 1865, the United States Christian Commission published its own history with the title, Christ in the Army. This is the US Christian Commission pictured here with their tent uh, near a battlefield. Union mortars shed their blood with that of the greatest redeemer of mankind. One Unitarian minister preached that the war served as a national atonement by blood. Sometimes the experience of battle drove Union soldiers to, to Christ and brought hopes to be with him afterward. One soldier professed faith in Christ after being wounded twice. He said, Jesus owns me. Oh, how sweet to feel that if we fall on the field of strife, we only fall to rise to higher and more perfect bliss than this world can give. My object is to live for heaven. Of course, the most popular and enduring linkage of Christ and the Northern military was Julia Ward's Howe, Battle Hymn of the Republic. She wrote it after viewing a Union Army regiment along the Potomac River, sleeping in Willard's Hotel in Washington, DC. She awoke in the gray of a morning twilight. The tune of John Brown's body raced through her mind, and she scribbled quickly a new song for the Union effort. She invoked a series of religious images from the mine eyes have seen the glory of Isaiah to the let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel of Genesis. The entire song built upon the idea of Christ's presence in the Union Army. But while the spirit of Jesus was present, he was also distant. He was not an American. God was not one of us. The notion of Christ from beyond the sea, both literally and figuratively, punctuated the song. But the otherness of Jesus did not mean that his ethics should not be followed. Just as the Jew would look hopefully for the Messiah, a South Carolinian commented at the war's end, so has the Negro for 40 years been looking for the man of universal freedom. The Christ of the slaves and the Christ of the abolitionists had come to the South. As commander of the black First South Carolina Volunteers, the white abolitionist and literary figure Thomas Wentworth Higginson recorded some of the most classic expressions of black testimony from this era. For Higginson, slave theology exhibited, quote, nothing but patience for this life 
nothing but triumph in the next. Yet Higginson's own descriptions of his men's expressions contradicted this interpretation, for his men anticipated imminent triumph in this life through the graces, graces of King Jesus and Father Abraham. His troops understood perfectly well that freedom was coming, and they saw Jesus at the head of the army ushering in the new era. Right in, kind Savior, he recorded his men singing around the campfires. No man can hinder me. Oh, Jesus is a mighty man. Oh, Sasesh, done come and gone. No man can hinder me. Higginson heard the classic exhortation to prepare one's soul for the Savior. Jesus call you, go in the wilderness, go in the wilderness to wait upon the Lord. But with the coming of the war, Jesus' face could be seen. The slave could purge the guilty land by calling America back to a truer vision. In this way, the slave's own sacrifice over generations of time, blood, and labor would serve the redemptive mission of purifying an America stained with the sin of crucifying its most Christ-like figures. Northern whites and African Americans had a new Christ figure when Abraham Lincoln was shot on Good Friday, April 14, 1865. It became commonplace to compare him to Jesus as both liberator and reconciler. Upon hearing of Lincoln's death, one slave reportedly said, Lincoln died for we, Christ died for we, and me, believe him, the same man's. Herman Melville lamented that Lincoln was killed in his pity and praised the fallen president as the forgiver. A Methodist minister implored Northerners to push for peace. If anything that you read or hear in these sad days breeds within you a single revengeful feeling, even towards the leaders of this rebellion, he proclaimed, then think of Abraham Lincoln and pray to God to make you merciful. Think of the prayer of Christ, which the president said after his savior, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mass freedom and citizenship for African Americans after the war meant the possibility of an entirely new material world, including a new world possibly of imagery. What pictures should African Americans use in their homes and churches? As early as 1862, black abolitionist T. Morris Chester called on African Americans to take down pictures of white politicians, leaders, and military heroes. He wanted them replaced with images of powerful African Americans past and present, and he figured Bible pictures into the mix. Chester cautioned that black Americans should avoid any image that coded black with evil and white with good. Instead, he thought, Amer he thought American history proved that if God had a color, the sacred was black. Quote, as if, quote, as it is a mere speculation, which is the color of the inhabitants of the celestial and infernal regions, I am confident that if the development of the two races are an index to their complexion, that God and his winged seraphs are black, while the devil and his howling imps are white." Unquote. If you want a scene from the Bible, he said, and when the creators and his angels are presented as white, tell him that you would be guilty of sacrilege in encouraging the circulation of a libel upon the legions of heaven. Now Chester's words would be felt from the Civil War all the way through the 20th century, the, the, the words of divinizing blackness or getting away from the, the sacralization of whiteness, but in his era they were impractical. African Americans did not have the consumer power or the production capabilities to mass distribute black icons. They could not do what white Americans had done in the antebellum era and mass produce images of white Jesus such as we had saw earlier in the talk. The white Jesus, though, could still be deployed on the side of racial justice, but northern whites also wanted him to oversee national harmony. So Jesus makes a notable visual appearance in this busy print from 1867, simply titled Reconstruction. The reconstructed nation here would be built upon new pillars of justice, liberty, and education. Universal suffrage would enfranchise African-American men, and black and white children would be treated equally. In the center, a white Jesus, by the way, this print was um, uh, created to celebrate the passage of the 14th Amendment in Congress. In the center, a white Jesus with long flowing hair offered political, social, and religious reconstruction 
uh, for the reconstructed nation. And he says, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Southern whites, of course, objected strenuously. Former Confederates certainly did not endorse citizenship for all blacks and suffrage for black men, and they did not want Jesus associated with racial justice in this way. Confederates and their children found an answer to their Jesus problem by reclaiming the mantle of suffering. What had been a theological conundrum for the white South became the solution for the white South. Southerners, that is, transformed Jesus back into a sufferer and themselves into the ones who had, been, who had truly borne the cross. If white Southerners, in the famous argument of C. Van Woodward, had experienced the human realities of loss and defeat in a way that was unlike that for white Americans generally, then Jesus could bind their wounds. <coughs> Defeated Confederates created in Jesus a suffering savior who sanctified their warriors of the past and the lost cause theology of the post-war present. So Southern ministers after the war frequently connected the suffering Christ to the dying Christ. From the hundreds of Confederate monuments setting in biblical relief the major Southern war heroes to the addresses at yearly Sons of Confederate meetings and United Daughters of the Confederacy meetings. To the inscriptions on the monuments themselves, Jesus sanctified the myth of the unified white Southern people who had fought for him. Nashville Presbyterian James I. Vance, for example, explained that his enemies would nail Christ to the cross, but they could not quench the ideals he embodied. His seemed to be a lost cause as the darkness fell on the great tragedy, but out of what seemed Golgotha's irretrievable defeat has come the cause whose mission it is to save that which is lost. This was the, uh, a predominant theme through the late 19th century of much white Southern literature, including of this classic from 1887, John William Jones's Christ in the Camp, which outlined the major tenets of what historians typically call lost cause religion. It ensured that Jesus and revivalism defined Southern memory of the war as much as political concepts of liberty or fighting for their homeland. As Southerners remembered the war, to receive Jesus prepared Southern soldiers to fight for freedom, and for them, to see Jesus was to envision victory in the here and the hereafter. The ferocity of the war itself naturally turned men's thoughts to the divine. After revival swept their camp, soldiers stationed for battle in Orange County, Virginia, steeled themselves for war with praises of Jesus. One correspondent cheered that the men were enlisting under the unfurled banner of King Emmanuel. Amid the storms of war, the men felt, quote, safe in the arms of Jesus. Whiteness never defined this Jesus, just as racial categories were not explicitly used in the new Southern laws of the 1890s that circumvented the 14th and 15th Amendments. Instead, Confederates described Jesus in terms of warmth, com comfort, and compassion for their suffering. When they saw Jesus, they beheld glorious brightness, which came straight from my Savior's countenance, in the words of one woman. One account describes standing by the bedside of one of the heroes who are daily offering themselves as sacrifices upon the altar of their country. As he lay, as he lay uh, upon the thin, excuse me, as he gazed upon the thin, emaciated form of the soldier on the cot, he thought, Jesus, the King of Kings, dwells here, and I had rather be this poor soldier than to be the tenant of any palace. Key to this post-war mythology was the exalting of Southern war heroes as Christian evangelical gentlemen. The United Confederate Veterans, for example, heralded the Civil War as one baptized by the consecration of Christian Knights of the South, whose proud names and glorious fame shall endure forever. As a symbolic Christ figure, the morally spotless but betrayed by the sins of lesser men, General James Longstreet usually standing in for Judas in this story. Robert E. Lee showed how a character could be honed to perfection by pain. He embodied how the South had, quote, transformed the shame of its worldly failure into a glorious metaphysical triumph. Lee lived not for himself, but for his fellow men 
for the sign of the cross was upon his life at the dedication ceremony for the newly constructed Lee Chap Washington College, pictured here. Senator John W. Daniel of Virginia called Lee the priest of his people who drank every drop of sorrow's cup. The chapel where Lee's remains rested was transformed into a, quote, holy place. So by the end of the 19th century, Confederates and their children had brought Jesus into their fold. Although they had lost control of Christ's meaning and importance in the antebellum period, Confederates took him back by merging the warrior with the sufferer. In this way, the white South became like, white, uh, like Christ crucified. Turning death into life was Christ's supernatural trick, and through the lost cause, Southern whites hoped to find strength after sorrow. When our divine master perished on the cross, did the doctrines for which he died perish with him? Asked the former South Carolina general and politician, Wade Hampton. The answer obviously was no. Jesus became a Southerner first in his suffering. He became a white Southerner only after Confederate failure during the Civil War, and he became an American Southern white Jesus in the early 20th century in the popular culture of the early 20th century through writers such as Thomas Dixon and through films such as Birth of a Nation. For many black Americans, nothing symbolized the shift in their fortune. Harry O's brother, the most famous man in America, Henry Ward Beecher. Before the war, he had been an abolitionist, quite famously. He had heralded black soldiers as heroes of the age and thought the spirit of Christ rested in the abolitionist cause. Almost immediately after the war, however, he embraced the white South with open arms. He became, in the sarcastic words of Frederick Douglass, an apostle of forgiveness. In the early 1870s, Beecher set in motion a new way of representing Jesus in the racial and political reconfiguration of America. He established a rhetorical and visual shell game in which white Americans could claim Jesus as their own without words. So in his biography of Jesus called The Life of Christ, Jesus the Christ, published in 1871, the first biography of Jesus in American history, um, Beecher admitted that it was impossible to know truly the contents of Christ's countenance. He said, to his form, his height, the character of his face, or any single feature of it, there is not the slightest illusion. Beecher obviously knew his Bible. He knew there was no physical description of Jesus. Text was one thing, however, art was another. Beecher included five visual heads of Christ on one page of his book. All were from European artists and all featured a white Jesus with brown hair and brown eyes, pretty typical imagery for the 19th century. With text and image, Beecher set up Jesus so that white Americans and Europeans could claim him rhetorically as a universal non-white savior, but visually as one of their own. As had Beecher's sister, he too distanced Jesus from whiteness by claiming they were of different races. He said, he was of the Semitic race, we are of the Japetic race, uh, employing the categories of Old Testament mythology that would have been uh, familiar to people in the 19th century. And so these racial differences, Beecher insisted, spoke to differences of mind, spirituality, and worldview. Then Beecher put another spin on it. In a spiritual sense, Christ was a man of all nations of people. Quote, as Christ spiritually united in himself all nationalities, so in art his head has a certain universality, Beecher said. All races find in it something of their race features. Together, the visuals, the racial otherness, and the universalism added up to a singular mix of racial similarity and difference, spiritual closeness and strangeness. Read together, the pictures in the text showed Beecher taking racial particularity, that is to say whiteness, wrapping it in religious particularity, that is to say Protestantism, and claiming it as human universality. Disillusioned by their abandonment and by their surge in racist violence in the late 19th century, black ministers, activists, and politicians combed religious texts for explanations. They were trying to understand what the Bible said about what they were experiencing during what is sometimes called the nadir of race relations in American history in the late 19th century. Henry McNeil, the, the racialization of Christ into a symbol of white Southern purity, 
demanded radical counter theologies. One of them came from Henry McNeil Turner, a Union Army chaplain and organizer for the African American Episcopal Church in the South. After the war, he said, quote, we have as much right biblically and otherwise to believe that God is a Negro as you buckra or white people have to believe that God is a fine looking symmetrical and ornamented white man. Not that Turner thought that Jesus or God had any particular racial characteristics, but he was simply pointing out that Americans had already long been imposing racial ideas upon Jesus. And if whites could do it, everyone else could do it just as well. Now, Turner had a tumultuous time as a Reconstruction state legislature in Georgia, and this embittered him towards the prospects of equality for black Americans. Late in the 19th century, in fact, he became an advocate for black immigration to Africa. But Turner understood that the racialization of the divine, that is the, the imposing of a, an American racial conception upon Jesus, devastated freed people already imprinted with the stigma of slavery. In an anthology of essays devoted to finding the meaning of Africa in an age of colonialism, Turner complained, quote, everything that is satanic, corrupt, base, and infamous is denominated as black, and all that constitutes virtue, purity, innocence, religion, and that which is divine and heavenly is represented as white. As a well-known AME bishop, Turner's words received much attention but a tour through the lesser known black publications of this era, the black press, self-published books and things of this sort, suggests the spread of his views. In 1893, the editor of the Cleveland Gazette announced with the headline, Christ Jesus, not white. Just as abolitionists had positioned Jesus in America as a slave, this paper now suggested that Jesus would suffer the shame of segregation. It said, Christ was not of the Caucasian race or races, but if he were living in Kentucky today, he would be cooped up in the Jim Crow cars. Some new black Pentecostals of the South agreed. In Wrightsville, Arkansas, William Christian of the Church of the Living God created a catechism that tied black, biblical characters to black America. Unlike antebellum slave catechisms that sanctified service, Christian divinized blackness. He taught that Job, Moses' wife, and even Jesus were black. So the catechism for his church included the following. Question, was Jesus a member of the black race? Answer, yes. And Christian later went on to argue that the um, lost tribe of Israel in the Bible were black people who had been reclaimed later by Jesus, and therefore black people were really Jews as well as Christians. Another self-published author, Willard Hunter, turned to biblical genealogies to prove this in 1901 with his book of the title, Jesus Christ Had Negro Blood in His Veins. Charting biblical genealogies, Hunter concluded that, quote, Jesus Christ came nearer being a black man than a white man, or at the least a very dark man. This meant that whites unknowingly worshiped a black deity. Will the white man worship a black savior, he asked? Yet that is what they do every day in the week and must forever do or have no savior at all. For we have proven that the incarnate savior was nearer a black than a white man. And if he was living in the United States today, he would be called a Negro. Meanwhile, intellectuals such as W.E.B. Du Bois described Jesus as a dark and pierced Jew in the souls of black folk. While painters such as Henry Osawa Tanner also placed Jesus in his ancient Jewish and North African milieu. Du Bois claimed that segregation placed African Americans somehow curtained behind a veil, the kind of veil that in biblical times hid Moses' face after he spoke with God, or that separated the Holy of Holies. The veil <coughs> hid the sacred from the profane, and so it was to Du Bois that African Americans were sacred in American culture because they were behind the veil. In the 20th century, paintings such as Clementine Hunter's Cotton Crucifixion, Clementine Hunter was a black Louisianan, uh, illiterate woman, but a prolific artist. Uh, so her painting, Cotton Crucifixion, carried on a sort of black folk tradition of understanding Jesus as symbolically black, hanging over the Roman soldiers of cotton while Harlem Renaissance artists and poets identified Jesus poetically with black suffering, 
and placed Jesus in the context of paintings which drew from modernist and surrealist elements, such as this painting from 1939 uh, by William H. Johnson, Jesus and Mary. So it draws from modernist and surrealist elements. That's why the limbs are exaggerated as they are, but it unmistakably racially identified the savior. So in this kind of art, in, in, the, in the writing of intellectuals such as Du Bois, and in black folk tradition and in the black press, you see um, a strong countercurrent of resistance to the idea of the sacralization of whiteness represented in the white form of Jesus. And so, to conclude, emerging out of the Civil War, the cauldron of a Civil War and Reconstruction, which promised freedom but sacralized whiteness, a black counter tradition divinized blackness long before the emergence of what would later be called black liberation theology. The battle for Jesus through the Civil War era was really a battle for the soul and the souls, as Du Bois put it, of America. And that was not a battle decided by the Civil War itself. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. We're going to have time for some questions, but I'm aware that some of you have appointments you need to get to. Uh, so we'll take uh, just a minute for, for you to take off if you need to, and then we'll have uh, questions and answers with Professor Harvey. OK, let's come back together. And uh, if you have a question, if you could uh, raise your hand, and Professor Harvey will I'll call on you. And when you ask your question, if you could stand up and speak out loud, that, that would be great so that, that we could all hear you. Who has a question? Yeah, um, I should credit my co-author who actually came up with that phrase. I've just kind of stolen it from him for today's talk, uh, Edward J. Bloom. But the idea there was to, we were trying to think about all the different ways that peoples of the 19th century would encounter a racialized body and image of Jesus. So um, what did it mean that, so we're reading all the slave narratives, they envisioned Jesus as white in their visions and in their salvation stories. And not only as white, but like, extremely detailed descriptions, hair parted in the middle. So that first image that you saw, let's go all the way back here. So slave images were describing the one on the left there, almost exactly like that. Okay, so what does it mean? Does that mean that they have bought into kind of an ideology of whiteness, whiteness supremacy or whatever in the 19th century? Well, clearly not, if you look at the way slave religion operates. Um, so what does it mean? It, it, the other thing they say is, although they describe Jesus as looking like this, they often describe him as a very small, small man. And that's interesting because usually you imagine the divine as magnificent, huge, monstrous, whatever kind of image like that, that's usually, or so bright that you can't even see him, which is what Joseph Smith originally said in his first vision. Um, and so what does it mean to imagine Jesus, first of all, as a white man with this level of detail, but also small, also allied with you, also talking to you, right, uh, in a way that would never happen with the context of white men on earth, or would rarely happen at least with the context of white men on earth. Uh, and so the idea is, um, uh, Jesus is a trickster in the Trinity in the sense that he is tricking the uses to which whites are intending to put him. That's how we're using it in, in, the, in the work. Okay, now, whites are using it for entirely different purposes, and we went into that in the talk and so forth, but that, that's how it's used in the, in the context of slaves. Yes? question is, 
you think that Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis were Christians? Well, I never presumed to know what anybody's religious beliefs are to, to pronounce on that. They profess to be Christians, and so that's a good enough answer for me. Other questions or comments? So, Tommy? Uh, could you talk a little more about the, the uh, Henry Ward Beecher depiction uh -huh. of Christ and what the, what the significance of that was? Because, I, I mean, it sounds like on one hand, he's acknowledging that, you know, in, <clears> there's <throat> some kind of ethnic difference that he's Semitic and we're not and, and this sort of thing. And, and, I wasn't, I wasn't completely sure what was going on in those pictures. Because it looked like he was trying to say, well, there's these racial characteristics that are sort of different races are represented, but it didn't really look like any of them were, I mean, anything other than kind of European. Precisely. That's maybe, a, maybe like Middle Eastern a little bit or something. But so can you, I mean, that's just really interesting. Yeah. What, so the we have a much longer section of this in the book it's kind of hard to explain it all but the idea is the text and the image do not go together at all and so the text is this really weird turning of cartwheels explaining that jesus is universal because he represents some of all races and yet he's a different race than us because he came from the Jews and we come from the Jeppes and all that kind of stuff that you, you're familiar with um, and so but nonetheless he but is actually quite coherent five different heads of Jesus. Uh, and they do not represent different races. It's pretty obvious to us what they, what they represent, okay? And so why would, he, um, why would he employ that kind of image in his book in which, in some ways, his text is trying to make a, a point that's not like that and in some ways counter to that? Uh, and I think that represents some of the ambiguity and confusions that has gone into this whole discussion in, in the 19th century. Uh, but I think it also represents the fact of what we say in the book is that what Jesus becomes white without words. And what white without words means is you don't have to describe them, but there's a default image that everyone knows what you're referring to. So I'll give you another example of that. In the latter little epilogue to this book, we have a section about Jesus jokes from the 1970s forward, like jokes about Jesus in sitcoms, that kind of thing. And the thing about the jokes is you have to know what they refer to because they all play on Warner Salmon. You have to know that image so that when um, Jimmy Walker in Good Times is arguing with his family about whether they're going to replace this thing with a black Jesus on the wall, and of course grandmother doesn't want to do that because grandmother grew up with this image and Jimmy Walker wants to do it. And eventually they put both of them up on the wall and Jimmy Walker says, Dino might at the end of that. Um, but you see, the, the entire premise of the joke is depending upon knowing the default, knowing the referent. Um, and so I think some of that is going into the, the Henry Ward Beecher image here as well. But it's very confusing. It's, a, it's a very confusing, but it's confusing in part because the text, doesn't, the text doesn't go along with the image and they really almost convey two different ideas entirely. Yes, right there. Sorry, I don't know your name. So your comment about Joseph Smith sparked this for me. Yeah. The, so Mormons with their interesting theology of whiteness and blackness in the 19th century, did they have a development of image of Jesus? And did it interact with what was going on with the North and South in the Civil War? Or was it a totally different trajectory? No, not in, it's the same trajectory. But here's the thing, what's so fascinating about Joseph Smith's visions. And let me say, I didn't write this part of the book, so I'm, I'm relying. <laughs> This is 100% my co-author. I didn't write this part, but I'll tell you what he wrote of it. I edited it and said, sounds good to me, and researched it and verified it. But. So the argument there is um, the, the image of Joseph, the first vision of Joseph Smith is one of Jesus of ineffable brightness. And what happens is Joseph Smith edits his writings over about a decade of time. So when the final version appears in 1842, I believe it is, light has been changed to white. Literally, the words have changed from light to white. So it has gone from ineffable brightness to one of 
a pretty racially identifiably white man. And he has other writings in which he expresses that in more detail. And Brigham Young picks up on that, adds the Curse of Cain business in the 1850s, and you know all about that, and the tragic history of that in Mormonism. Very similar history to many other Christian denominations. So, um, but that, that's going on at precisely, I mean, pr almost to the year of the moment in which um, Americans have, are, are settling on what Jesus is going to look like in our culture. So most people have the idea that this just kind of magically gets shipped over from Europe and on the Arabella in 1630 with the Puritans or whatever. That's totally wrong, okay? And most of the colonial era, there just isn't an image of Jesus amongst Protestants. Catholics are a different story. I didn't talk about them today, but that's a whole other thing. But the predominant religious group that takes power in what becomes the United States um, are defined by people who don't believe in images. Okay, in the 19th century, obviously that begins to change. Images proliferate. A, a lot of it is because Protestants want children to have images. Uh, it has to do with the changes of Protestantism. Catholics are distributing images, so Protestants are like, we gotta compete with them, and that, that's part of it too. And they're doing that and creating and mass producing images, for, and it's the first time you can do that, because you gotta have steam printing presses, you gotta have steamboats. So it's really 1830s, 20s, 30s are the first time you can really do that. That's when Joseph Smith is creating his visions, and it follows. So in the book we use him, not because we're trying to beat up Mormonism, we're not, but because he almost perfectly represents this bigger story of uh, from, from lightness to whiteness, from ineffable brightness that just blinds you to a more racially identifiable figure. Thank you. Would you say something about the Catholic images? Yeah. Um, so, the Jesuits have all kinds of images that they are, I did write this part, by the way, unlike the Mormon part, so I'll speak to it a little more confidently. So the Jesuits have all kinds of images, mostly uh, in the form of, of cross, not some, but the, the emphasis there is not so much on the racial complexion of Jesus as it is on the suffering of Jesus. They're more or less generic images uh, of Jesus on a cross. The emphasis is on the, the, the suffering of the person there. Uh, Moravians pick up on this. So Moravians famously have this blood and wound theology which emphasizes the blood flowing out of the side hole that Jesus was pierced with. And people are, in Moravian paintings, people are sitting underneath the cross trying to catch the blood coming down. It's, a, it's very similar to, to uh, a bit more graphic, but somewhat similar to some Catholic imagery. Um, there's a couple things you could say about that. First of all, Catholics don't control the dominant imagery in America. So they're not, they're not central to our story because they don't control that. Secondly, they're not, they're concerned with uh, symbolically portraying suffering, not uh, giving the body of Jesus a racially identifiable form, okay? Um, thirdly, Catholics, most of the, a good deal of the early part of the book is taken up with Catholics, uh, Jesuits with Indians, Franciscans with Puebloans in New Mexico. And much of that story is a story about how Catholics respond to iconoclasm among Indians. That is to say, what do Puebloans do in 1680 when they kick the Franciscans out? They take every single Christian image they can find and defile them in every single way they can possibly think of. Burn them, shred them, break them up, defecate on them, anything they can do to uh, desacralize those images. Periodically, if you read the Jesuit relations, they'll relate how happy they are. They've converted some particular band of Indians somewhere along the Mississippi River. Come back 20 years later, Indians are happily pointing out where they have killed some missionary 10 years ago and left remains of Christian symbology uh, shattered and burnt or something across the, across the, the guy's grave, trying to tell them, you know, this, this symbolically represents how we have come to see your religion as false and have to return to our own ways and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a very complicated story with, with early Catholicism in America, but it's a little bit of a different story than the one that I'm talking about here. Um, but if you're interested in it for all the details, I hope you read the, at least the early part of the book. If you're not interested, just read the epilogue because it's short and it's full of jokes and it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah.
you believe that these perceptions that Americans had in the past of who Jesus was and what he looked like have carried over into the present? And specifically, how they might impact how a white Christian in America today can relate to a black Christian in America today? Yeah, so we have a lot to say about that. So let me say just a couple of things real quick. One is, um, we did this experiment where we just Googled different things, Googled Jesus or Christ, and see what kind of images appear, overwhelmingly white. Doesn't mean there's not plenty of black Jesuses and every other kind of Jesus on the internet. Google black Jesus, you'll find all kinds of stuff, Asian Jesus, whatever. Just Jesus himself though, you see the effect of the history because it's built into the algorithms by which Google operates. That's why you end up with all these kinds of white images. Now, if you went around and asked the average person, what color was Jesus? We get this all the time. What do you think Jesus' color was? Which is not a question that I particularly care about, but to the degree I would say anything about it, it's ancient, Near East, Af North African guy, probably looks something like that, whatever. Um, but the Bible doesn't say, and our book isn't about that anyway. But what I would say here is, um, so if you, if you ask someone, ask the average person today, so you're not gonna get a response like you were in the 19th century because we're more, we sort of gotten beyond the whiteness of Jesus as a thing. And we recognize this comes from a different culture, it doesn't look like this and so forth. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not built into the algorithms of our culture in a way that requires us to understand it in order to get the joke requires us to understand it in order to understand why Google brings us the images that you see if you just Google that. Um, and arguably, arguably, um, beyond the body and form of Jesus, the sacralization of whiteness is so deeply embedded in American history that that's the one that I think you're interested in when you say what can white and black Christian, or how can white Christians deal with this now? That's the one that's the hardest to deal with. Not because people are conscious of it or not because people think Jesus is white or whatever, um, but because the, the long history of this is not something that just vanishes or goes away. So I think just to be aware of it and to understand the ways in which um, uh, culture continues the sacralization of whiteness often unconsciously is important to think about at least. Yeah. Trying to claim God for oneself, yep, or just yep. kind of grabbing at the divine for your own purposes. I wonder if you could speak here behind this to the question of anti Semitism. Because the particularity of Jesus is, of course, rooted in a very particular, when you talk about what did Jesus look like, uh, the scripture doesn't give you a physical description, it very much gives you a lineage. Though. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it yeah. Jesus in a people. I think of yeah. Karl Barth's sermon after the sports palace debacle in Germany, where half the congregation got up and walked out after his first line, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the blood that flowed through Jesus' veins was Jewish blood. Yep. Um, could you speak to that behind some of this? Yeah, the, um, I'll, I'll tell you the part of the book where we deal with that the most directly is the part that deals with kind of late 19th, early 20th century, because of course that's an era of huge Jewish immigration. So it's really the, Jews are such a small part of the population in America that it's almost never an issue prior to that time because people just don't think about it or they've sort of categorized Jews as white and whatever. Um, but when you get to kind of the discussions of immigration by the late 19th, early 20th century, what happens, this is really true of the early 20th century, what happens is people, artists, writers, others, begin self-consciously to try to desemitize Jesus. So I'll give you an example of that. One is the, the writer, Madison Grant, a famous writer, the early 20th century. He's an anti-immigration writer, kind of helps form what becomes the immigration law of 1925, trying to stop immigration of people from Russia and Eastern Europe and places like that. So what Madison Grant in The Passing of the Great Race says is the following. He says, Jesus was a Jew, we know that, but Jesus had Anglo-Saxon characteristics as a character. What are Anglo-Saxon characteristics? He then goes on to enumerate them. Basically all good virtues that you would want anyone to have. 
Um, and so we know that people's characteristics internally are written into their physical body. And so, therefore, although Jesus was Jewish, he says basically, although Jesus was Jewish, he didn't look like a Jew because he didn't have the characteristics of the Jew. He had the characteristics of an Anglo-Saxon. Okay, a really weird argument. But it, he has to do that because Madison Grant's not a smart man. He's perfectly well aware of what you just said. So he's got to find a way to jump over the whole <laughs> genealogical thing. And he's not the only one that's doing that, by the way, in the early 20th century. Okay. We, uh, you could also trace this through the history of film through the course of the 20th century. So Mel Gibson picks uh, an Anglo guy to portray Jesus in the Passion, but tries to, in this case, tries to re him, because this is a guy with blue eyes, and they make him, they recolor the film so he has brown eyes, literally in the film. They literally recolor it, even as they're making a film that employs all kinds of tropes of medieval anti-Semitism, I think unconsciously, but it's perfectly obvious if you watch it and know anything about the images that come out of medieval anti-Semitism. So just think about that. He's trying to re-Semitize them in a film that is castigated to some degree justly, I believe, for employing all kinds of anti-Semitic images. Okay, if any of you all are watching the Bible miniseries going on right now, what does Jesus look like there? <laughs> about as white as you can get. Portuguese guy, but he's a, you know, he's got, he's a classic image. So he, he steps right out of the history of American film, yeah. right into the miniseries, okay? So other guys, like Satan, for example, <laughs> can be portrayed as dark and various other kinds of characters. Uh, and if you're a really strong, brutish guy like Samson, then you can be black as he's portrayed in the film. Um, but, uh, you just really cannot have a uh, widely successful popular cultural depiction that would have used Jesus as a black figure, I believe. You, there's plenty, of, there's other films that portray Jesus as a black figure, largely made by black filmmakers, and they tend to flop, usually because they're so deliberately propagandistic that they're just not very good movies. Um, and so the Bible is, I mean, maybe good, may not, we can all, we can argue about that, but they, I mean, they've, all of the, imagery of just the actors they've chosen, they're so typical, almost right from the history of American cinema, right into that miniseries. It's just like from central casting, really is. Yeah? What are the practical implications for the church in America today when it comes to religious art? Because um, it would seem that in some ways mm -hmm. we should just get rid of everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, as a should I feel guilty about having uh, what my children call hallway Jesus up in our house, uh, which is a beautiful mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. I inherited from my parents? Um, you know, so, so, so what do we do with this? Yeah. Um, well, I'll, my first answer to this is I'm a historian, not a prophet to tell you what to do with yourself. So I'm just going to give you the history and you can decide what to do with it. Okay, but I could say a couple things about it. One is... Um, if the images are truly symbolic and are divorced in, from everything else the, in terms of teaching your children about whatever, then the hallway Jesus kind of doesn't matter. That's just one image of many. Or you could say, in terms of a larger church community, you could say, um, let's portray him variously to portray the fact that Jesus is a universal figure. And so we begin the book with the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham in 1963 big Werner Solomon Jesus in their window, his face gets blown out. So they literally get to decide what face they put back in. And there's an interesting story behind that. Um, but note that it's a black church at the center of the civil rights struggle that has a white Jesus. Okay, so one thing you could say is white Jesus historically has been used to, for all kinds of purposes, if he's used for the right purpose, who cares what the image is? That's a perfectly plausible answer. Or you could say, like the 60 Street Baptist Church did, we can put this image back, and then we can put this other image, which they did, a kind of a black and Jesus image that was created by an artist. And so they, just both of them there. Um, and I think both of those are perfectly reasonable. So it's really the content of the message more than the 
Or you could use it as a kind of object lesson. Here's Jesus in the hallway. Why does he look like that? What does it mean if we understand him within the context of ancient Semitic culture that he comes from when your children get a little older and they can, <laughs> when they can understand that kind of thing? I don't mean right now. Okay. Um, uh, there's one other story that uh, I'll tell you about. In, um, Martin Luther King was asked the question in a newspaper in 1957, uh, why did God make Jesus white when most of the peoples in the world are non-white? He was asked that in an advice column because he used to do an advice column. So he answered the advice column, most of which has to do with the things that you would expect him to say. Jesus is about spirit, not appearance. Doesn't matter what he looked like. It's about the content of your character, so forth and so on, that kind of thing. So he could have just stopped there because that's really all he needed to say. He adds a second paragraph, which is very interesting though. He says, Jesus would have been no more significant if his skin had been black. He is no less significant because his skin was white. Which directly contradicts what he just said in the paragraph before, which tried to get away from the whole racialization thing, but it's so powerful that he can't get away from it. He kind of has to address it. So someone writes him back after that and says, why did you say Jesus was white? Jesus wasn't white, blah, 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 and goes into the whole genealogy thing. He's really from North Africa and so forth. Uh, and then King never responds to that, so it just, the discussion dies at that, at that point. Um, but you know, King could have just answered with the first paragraph and left it at that. And then the image just becomes a symbol that is just merely a symbol that we use to think about larger universal things. So oh, those are different kinds of answers I would give. You can kind of make up your own mind about that. Can yes. I just yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, thanks for the, the whole presentation. It was great. I'm looking forward to, to taking a look at the book. It's interesting when you bring up Martin Luther King Jr. We have a, a, a Chinese designer designing a Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know monument in Washington D.C. and doesn't just choose a stone that that happens to be white, but actually is named White Granite to do that. Um, and so the, the question about hallway Jesus is an interesting one because while I can explain to my children the implications of that. Future generations can take a look at this as um, you and your co-author do, looking at as a historical you know, artifact, in effect. Historical artifact, and um, and take a look at that and say, okay, what are the what are the implications? Uh, what are the implications that yeah. we made by doing this? This is in fact going on. The the, the uh, biggest mistake we made in this book was having one paragraph about the big 11-foot Jesus at the uh, in the second floor of the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. It's called Christus. Um, and this is kind of an afterthought in the book, we just put it in there for interest, but it's an 11 foot marble Jesus, white flowing hair, European features, etc., put there in 1965 uh, because there was a World's Fair that was going to go on. They needed, Mormons were trying to present themselves to the world and so forth. So here, here's what happened. So the Mormons say this was actually um, modeled after a painting from a Danish painter in 1820. The World's Fair was coming here. It had nothing to do with the civil rights movement or anything else. We just wanted to present Mormonism to the world, so we put this thing here. Why are you guys saying that this has some kind of connotation? And all what we had said in the book was, this is a large, muscular, masculine, physical, white Jesus of European fi fixtures put in this temple in 1965. Whatever the intent, it cannot help but have implications to people of right at that particular period, okay? But I think the complicated thing is uh, what happened in the 60s and 70s with liberation theology as people increasingly begin to say, um, well, the color of Jesus is an ontological question, so we can just create it as we want because we want him to symbolize our suffering and so forth. But the thing is, that, that's a rabbit hole that goes, that goes infinitely every which direction. So pretty soon everyone's claiming a Jesus who looks like them as their own. So that's not a very good answer because that just, um, that never resolves anything because everyone's trying to kind of outsuffer the other, if you see what I mean, right? So it, it's a hard question to answer really, your first question, to, to go back to your first question. Okay, well I know we could probably go on for a while with this, this is terrific. Well, join me in thanking Professor Hall. Thank you guys.